Hello, my name is Judy Schmidt. I'm an artist and amateur astronomer. This video is intended to show how I process astronomical images from the Hubble Space Telescope. There's no single way of doing this, and I don't want to say this is the way of doing it. It's just my way. I've probably spent over a thousand hours processing space images by now, and it's my favorite thing to do in the world. Some required software is Photoshop and the Fitz Liberator. Fitz Liberator is free, and I'll put a link to it in, on the video and in the description. Photoshop is not free, and if you don't have any experience with Photoshop, this video may not be for you. I think you need to have a reasonable understanding of Photoshop before you can use it for processing. So a couple of steps before we jump into Photoshop. First we have to get the data, which in this case comes in Fitz format. To convert the Fitz images into something Photoshop can read, that's where Fitz Liberator comes in. I want to start by showing you how to use an archive. If you already know how or you just don't care about this, I'm putting a skip button for you to click. I thought about simply giving you files to download, but I think it is important to learn to find your own data so you can have freedom to be creative. When I started learning how to do this myself, there were a few tutorials I followed, but I remember how they kind of left me hanging at the end. I mean, it really won't do you much good to know how to put the data together and create a pretty picture if you don't know how to find the, some fresh data to work with yourself. So load up your web browser and to get to the MAST archive portal, type in mast.stsci.edu, press enter, and it should look like this. This is a multi-mission archive. It's got more than just Hubble in it. And I'm using this instead of the Hubble Legacy Archive, which was a bit more simple. It would have been easier to explain, but I heard they're phasing that out, and sometime this year, only masks will be available. Um, there are some tutorials that you can watch later if you want to know more, but I will try to show you how to search for just Hubble data right now. So what I like to do when I have no target in mind and just want to find something new to process is view the archive in chunks of time. Usually I'll view it in one year intervals for a single instrument and pick out something that interests me from there. We can't really do that with this simple search form though. Uh, if we click this show examples link we can see what is expected here and it, it's either wanting an object name or some coordinates and I usually don't have either one of those so for now we can ignore that. Um, you might guess that the random search would be useful for us since we don't know what we want uh, but because it is a positional search there may not even be any data there. You can still try it if you like but it may take you a few attempts before you find some Hubble data. So let's just click this advanced search link and open that window and wait for a moment. There is a lot here, but you can ignore most of it for now. Uh, just scroll down to the start time, select all for the left box there, type in 2003-09-08. Press tab, type in 2003-09-09, press enter, and we've got a very narrow one day search time. Uh, <laughs> a funny thing here is I still try to click this search button. I don't know if anyone else, if it's a problem for anyone else, but it is for me. I still try to click. It's the wrong button. You gotta click this one in the upper left corner. It says load the result of this query in a grid when you hover it. It's got a green downward facing arrow, so click it, and let's wait for our results. So here's everything from that day, which is September 8th, 2003. It's not too many things, only 207, uh, but we can whittle it down even further with these filters over here on the left. So for product, we're not doing spectroscopy, so we can just take off image. Uh, for mission, we, we only want Hubble, so take off HST. Sorry, Galax. Instrument, 
uh, we don't need STIS or STIS. I've never actually said that word, so I don't know if you pronounce it, but that's the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, and it, it usually does spectra, so we're not going to deal with it. Uh, with PIC 2 or the w Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 and uh, Planetary Camera Channel, we don't really, this is a little bit more difficult to work with. So we'll, we'll just go with the Advanced Camera for Surveys Wide Field Channel. This is a good one right here. Lots of good stuff from here. Check it out. And now let's look at the album view and see what we've got here. These inverted images actually come from dads, and I don't want to talk about dads right now because it's just going to add more complication to everything because you have to FTP and fill out a form and wait for it to happen. Anyway, uh, let's get rid of these by uh, checking off only HLA. Ignore HSD for now. So we're only getting results from the Hubble Legacy Archive, and right away we see this pretty, pretty galaxy right here. We can't really tell it's a pretty galaxy from the thumbnail because the thumbnail is so small. So if you want to see it closer, click these three dots and view it in the interactive display. And it'll open up a new window for you and then you can view it 100% zoom and pan around and see if it's something that you're interested in. So yeah, it's a really beautiful spiral galaxy and I think it would be really nice to process this so let's close this off and go get this data these data but can we make a color image we need at least two observations made with different wavelengths to do that so take a look at this line here it says filters f606w what does that mean the W means it's a wideband filter, which means it, it collected photons from a relatively wide section of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this number, 606, tells us that it was centered at around 606 nanometers, which to human, human eyes it translates to red. And the next one over, uh, F814W, is another wideband filter, but this time it goes beyond the red into near-infrared and humans can only see up to about 700 nanometers in wavelength so this is a hundred or so nanometers out of our range but now we can see it as a grayscale image so it's no problem for Hubble and these are two of the most common filters used by astronomers I mean <laughs> they're everywhere you can almost can't avoid the F814W in particular I mean it's <laughs> it's it's just about in everything I look at. Um, must be where all the science is. This detection filter isn't really a filter, it's actually a summation of all the other filters for a given observation, and I never use that one, so you can ignore it. So just click this checkbox and this checkbox, add it to your basket. Wait a moment. Uh, we've got some things that we don't really want here. If you click this, you gotta be careful because it, it zooms it up to the top there. And you can accidentally click it twice and then you'll end up with something like that. And you don't want that. That's useless for you. So just be careful. See that? <laughs> it just moves it up kind of stealthy. You don't even realize it happens. If you want to. Make sure you don't accidentally click these other things. You can go over here to description, click the show 11 more button, scroll down and select this HLA simple fits science image and that'll get you just that and you, you can check that all button and then and ready to download it. So just click this little diskette icon in the corner here and don't change the file name or format, just click download and we get this window here it says that you can close it without interrupting the bundling process I don't really recommend that because you can't get this progress bar back and you won't know what percentage is done if you close it off 
if it's going to take a while, you won't know. <laughs> so don't do that. Just be patient. Go do something else. And when it's complete, you get this pop-up. If you're on Windows, you can natively open zip files and just drag them out. This window pops up if you told it to open. You can go to your desktop, make a new folder. I went ahead and copy and pasted the name of that galaxy, which is MCG plus 07 33 027. It's just a coordinate, really. Got my folder here. And now you want to. Get just the just the fits files. That's all you really need. So go to those individual folders and drag them out and copy them. And you're good. You can close that out. Now if you've got Fitz Liberator already installed, you'll see this icon and it's the Eagle Nebula, one of Hubble's famous pillars of creation image. And you should be able to just double click it and open up the Fitz Liberator. Finally, we can start having some fun. If you've opened Fitz Liberator for the first time, it probably looks more like this. Uh, so there's some things we need to check out and make sure they're right. Uh, make sure flip image is turned on. If you have it off, it's going to be a mirror of what we see on the sky and it's going to upset the astronomer. So keep it turned on. That'll make sure north is up and east is left. Freeze your settings so that you can save them the next time you start up the, the program. Uh, these planes up here are just informational. You can look at them if you want, but they're not... If you were doing science, they'd be useful, but we're not doing science. We're just making pretty pictures. <coughs> so then head down to the scaling and stretch advanced section here and Change the stretch function to arc sine h. That's what the hyperbolic sine function. Whatever, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just use that one. I find that it works best for bringing out the details in those really dark areas. And if you if you play with it a bit, you might find one that you like better. I personally like the arc sine h of x. Um, I leave background level at zero. You can change it if you want, of course. Auto scaling usually gets a pretty good background level, if nothing else. To be honest, I don't really spend a lot of time in the Liberator. It's these generic numbers I'm putting in, one for the peak level and 100 for the scaled peak level, are just some starter numbers. They don't really do anything this time. It's so much easier to work in Photoshop that I don't really mess around with it too much unless it looks really bad or unless I'm doing a big mosaic or something. Play around with it. It'll get easier the more you use it. So the most important thing to look at now is the histogram, which is this graph at the bottom of the window. Because the image is mostly dark, we can see there's a pile up here at the left side, which tapers off gradually to the right. And the dark pile, which looks kind of like a pointy mountain, is very important to pay attention to. If it looks like a one pixel spike, then there's something wrong with the stretch, stretch function or the variables you've got in here. And it, you need to play with it until it gets at least a little bit wider than that. Um, <laughs> it's, it'll be very difficult to tease out these faint details if it's not very wide, or if it looks like a single pixel sticking up. So the next thing you want to do is just kind of zoom in here on the left side and move this black arrow just right up against where the, the, uh, the these little gray lines stop. If it looks something if it looks way too white like that, then you can you can go past them like you could go, go there if you want. but for, for this image, right here is good. And then you can do the same for the white. Show all. Move it over there to the very end. That, that actually works really well for this image. If you want, you can zoom into the the important featured galaxy and just use this white level picker tool and click the brightest pixel you see, and that'll yep, that'll make it look really good. It, it looks dark right now. 
it's gonna look dark until you get to the very end of processing. And there's a reason for that. You don't want to start out right away. Well, sometimes Fitz does this. If it does it, just close it off, restart it. That is, how, that is why you freeze the settings so you can just get right back to it. Um, yeah, so if you if you want to make it brighter so you can see, then the problem here is you're clipping the histogram like crazy. Let's zoom in. See how the middle of this galaxy is just a white blob now, and you don't want that, so leave the arrow way over there. Leave it dark. If you're working in 16-bit, it is no problem at all to change this later at the end in Photoshop and make it look nice and bright so everyone can see it. If you're working in 8-bit, it's going to be a little bit tougher because it's going to leave a lot of ugly banding and your computer should be able to handle 16-bit images. You'll be able to tell really quick if it can't. And if Photoshop seems really sluggish, you might have to just switch it to 8 and work in 8-bit until you get a better computer. There's not, there's no real work around. You have, either have to be very patient or just have a nice, quick computer. So save the file. It's gonna save a TIFF. Uh, you might have to direct the, the save dialog to the correct folder. Just make it jump it right back into this folder that you already have. No need to add another and move on to the next file and do the pretty much the same thing. This black spot here in the middle of the galaxy is just a place where some pixels became completely saturated and that's just the way to let you know that they were they were saturated. You, you can't do science on that. It's not going to be a good measurement. S same with this star. Com really bright star, completely saturated. Can't get, take any measurements from that. And that, that's why that's done. So there's no mistaking it. And you just fix this later on in Photoshop. No problem. Time for Photoshop. Start it up. Uh, just a quick tip. Work in the dark or uh, a dimly lit room with just ambient light. If you have a window behind you and the sun is shining on your back, that's very bad. Even the lines won't help with that sometimes. So if you have to, wait for the sun to go down. And if someone calls you weird or says you'll hurt your eyes for sitting in the dark, just remember the sun is like a billion times more powerful than your computer screen and no one tells you to stop looking outside. Uh, it's just a suggestion. Some people's some people say their eyes hurt if they do that, but I work in the dark all the time and I'm fine, but that's just me. So what are you thinking right now? How in the world is a red in an infrared image going to turn into an RGB picture? There's a really simple formula for translating any set of filters to an RGB image. And I'll probably use it like 95% of the time. Every now and then you'll get a complicated data set and it won't, like, maybe you'll have to do something a little different, but uh, in general you just want to put the longest wavelength in the red channel and the shortest in the blue channel, and anything else can go in between. Usually, you know, just if it's longer, redder, and if it's shorter, bluer. Pretty simple. Um, we only have two colors in this case, so we actually have to generate a green channel. and. If you've never done this before, but you're clever, you might be thinking ahead about what I'm go about to do. You might say, okay, so we're just going to paste the grayscale images directly into the channels. That's what I did the first time I did this, and but that's the hard way because you need to be able to get at the original channels very easily. So we need to think a little bit differently about how we're going to do this, and I'll just show you. So to start off, go to File, Scripts, and Load Files into Stack. Click Browse, navigate to your folder with your data in it, and select the two TIFF files. Click OK, click OK again.
and it's very convenient. It's already named your files for you so you can see which one is the 606W and which one is the 814W. Now convert them to smart objects. I've got a lot of actions that I use to do this much more quickly. I don't have to use the menu system, but I'll show you the slow way by using the menu so you can actually see what I'm doing. Definitely do make actions to save yourself a lot of time if you notice yourself doing something over and over again. I mean, you can see all my actions here, and I've got a mouse with like 12 buttons on the side, and I can just press those buttons and don't even have to look at a keyboard if I don't want to. Now convert the image to RGB. Don't merge and don't rasterize. Nothing bad will happen. And the smart objects are very convenient for saving the original data in case we make mistakes. If you realize you messed up, you can go and remove any filters or changes you made to get it back. It happens sometimes. You just don't like what you did and have to do it over again. Uh, to get a color image going, go ahead and make a couple of folders for your two channels. Uh, name one red, one blue. You can give them colors if you want. Helps you look at it better. And put the, like I said, put the longer wavelength in the red and the shorter in the blue. And now to actually make these red and blue, go ahead and double click. Don't double click the name. Double click somewhere else but the name. And uncheck G, uncheck R, click OK for the blue. And now go to the red channel, uncheck G, and uncheck B. Click OK. And it's magenta! We're missing green, obviously. Green is the most important channel. And it's interesting because almost nothing in space is green, but with our images the green channel seems to have the most dramatic effect. It's even more important for an image that makes use of three or more filters. What you put in the green channel can make or break an image. Today though we have green for dummies and it's the easiest thing ever. To make our pseudo green channel all we need is a single channel mixer adjustment layer. So go down here to this little circular button, go up to channel mixer, and drag it out to above the red channel. You don't want to end the red channel where it won't have any effect. Uh, Switch over here to, if you've got your uh, UI set up similar to me, I think I have a pretty default one, it just kind of puts the properties button here. You should be able to like, if it's closed, just double click it and anyway, use this pull down here. The output channel, change it to green, uh, delete this plus 100 from the green, and you want to pull in half from the red and half from the blue in order to create a green channel, so type in 50 for red and 50 for blue. And that's it. Look, you've got a green channel. It almost looks like a complete image already. It's very, very easy. Anyway, so rename this channel mixer to pseudo green. Give it a green color so it doesn't get mixed up with the red. And let's zoom out and look at this from a distance. There's not a whole lot to do in this. I don't know if you can see this faint streak going across here. That's kind of weird. Let me put a curves adjustment just to make sure you can see it. Yeah, maybe you can see it better now. Usually there will be like a single pixel, it'll look like a star going across and that'll be a, a satellite or an asteroid, probably an asteroid, just slowly creeping across during one of the exposures. But this is a really broad, faint, weird looking orange, well it, it was orange because it happened during one of the F814 exposures. and. It kind of makes me wonder if I will have like a close encounter with something nearby since it's so broad and faint. Maybe it was moving really fast and it actually t had some angular diameter to it when Hubble was looking this way. That's weird. Anyway, we'll get rid of it.
we'll get rid of this big thing here. This is a filter ghost, and it happens a lot around these very bright stars. And this is charge bleed happens because the electrons are overflowing because the star is too bright. And what I mean by the electrons overflowing is there's only each pixel can only hold so many. The photon comes in, it gets converted to an electron, and they kind of try to envision them like buckets. Each one is a bucket, and once it fills up, the, the, they just kind of overflow to the next nearest pixel and create these long, annoying, ugly streaks. This down here is, I guess it's called crosstalk. There's actually four CCDs com comprising this image, and for whatever reason, sometimes a mirror image of a very bright thing will show up as a dark ghost directly opposite from that. This orange looking thing is a glint. It probably came from this star. Traveled across. This weird looking thing here is also coming from the star. It's like another optical ghost. It's just over here. <laughs> looks. If you could see the whole thing it would look like a weird figure eight. It would finish up curve around here. But This is a, a star that's just on the edge of the detector. It's not like, this one is a little bit off, so it's just a diffraction spike. But this one is on the edge and it does this crazy looking fountain of light. It looks like a firework or something. They call it Dragon's Breath. And of course, this dark thing here is called a chip gap. It is my nemesis. The two detectors right next to each other here, thankfully, they butted up against, right up against each other, but across the two pairs is a gap and it's just always there you don't always get data filling a lot of times you just don't deal with it just crop it off because I mean you can't just make up data or you shouldn't you could if you wanted to for, for something like this galaxy you really shouldn't just make up data because I don't know it just seems unethical for some reason another thing I like to do is to help set up the file and make it easier to work with the data is create what I call utility channel mixers. You could switch to the channels tab and click red or blue. Hold on. Yeah. So now you can see this is just the red channel and this is just the blue channel. But Photoshop won't let you keep it like that and work on the image at the same time. If you go over here and you try, yeah, see it switches it back to RGB mode. And so to to work around this, I use a channel mixer for each channel. So go down to the to the adjustment layers button, create a new channel mixer, move it up above everything. They should always be at the very top. Rename this one to red only. In the properties window, uh, the output channel, whatever it is, if it's not red, change the output from that channel, in this case it's blue, change it to zero and go to the red one and tell it to pull everything from the red channel. Now we can switch to the green, change the green to zero and change red to 100%. And this isn't super intuitive, it might be confusing to you at first, but the more you work on it, the, the easier it will get. It will start to make sense to you, hopefully. So if I hide this, you can see the color, and now you turn it back on, and I can see the red only. And this is useful because if you work on the uh, RGB image itself, then this, this artifact here becomes like one thing. But it's easier if you separate it, isolate the image, each individual channel, and work on it al alone. So you don't have to, when you're editing the blue one out, you don't have to edit the, the orange one out at the same time. Go ahead and create another channel mixer for the blue. Name it blue only. Change its color to blue. Tell the red channel to be 0 and the blue to be 100 for the red output channel. Switch to the green output channel. Change green to 0 and blue to 100. So you, you could look at each output channel here and see for each one it's 
100% blue. Now we can see just the blue. And you can see the difference here if you click back and forth. Red, blue, red, blue. The next thing I want to do is quickly balance some colors. This looks pretty close to balanced already, but it's really not quite. Usually it will be a lot worse than this, like... Let me just show you an example. For like, See, this is totally orange now, and this is more typical of what it will look like when I pull it in. Or maybe the blue will be too bright and it'll look like that. And your eyes are really bad at making this determination. Don't rely on your eyes. Use your instrument. Use your tools. Your eyes can lie to you, strangely. But the color sampler tool, though, it won't lie. As long as it changes the sample size to something you know, at least 5x5. Five five. Uh, make sure you're sampling all layers and just click in the darker areas here. If you happen to have a layer selected that is on a layer mask and you try to use your color sampler, it, the only thing that comes up is this grayscale thing. Delete the layer mask. In fact, I like deleting all the layer masks. They're just a pet peeve. They shouldn't be there if you're not using them. Anyway, use your HSB color sliders so that you can see how saturated... How far away from gray is this? It's 20% saturated, that's pretty good, but you can do it better. So create a, a curves adjustment layer for each channel. And the way I make sure to balance this so that my eyes don't deceive me is use this little ellipse tool here. Find a dark place that's pretty smooth and doesn't have you know, it's just blank space and put it above your channels and change the color. Double click it on that little square. Set this to zero, zero, and seven percent is a number I use. I don't really have a reason for that, but I try to make the, instead of totally 100 percent black background, I raise it up above black and my goal is always 7%. It's kind of a standard that I came up with. Seems to look pretty good across various monitors. Some people have really dark screens and if you have the space be totally blank, I mean totally black, they can't see. It, it's like they'll only see say this part. They'll completely miss this. And people love to see these faint areas get a better better sense of what's going on with the galaxy. So now you can adjust these individually. You don't even have to go to like the red. You just leave it in RGB. Zoom in on this oval that I create that you create. And we can see turn on your adjustment layer here to the red only since we're working with red and it helps if you kind of defocus your eyes a little bit cuz the noise can be deceiving as well, and you just want to make that no that background noise be the same color as that oval. This one doesn't really need that much changing. Oh, make sure it ellipses below the curves adjustment layer, so that if you put it above, it's going to be the wrong color. Switch it to the blue. See if that one needs any changing. Yes, that one is too dark, so we want to lift it up a little bit. That's about right. Turn off your blue adjustment. Use your color picker tool again. And let's change it to 11 by 11. You can see now your saturation is nowhere near what it used to be. It used to be 20%, now it's 2, 5. Anything that's below about you know 10% is pretty good. Hide that ellipse. Now let's see about cleaning up some of these cosmetic issues. I alluded to this earlier, I like to work on the isolated channels instead of both at once. It does take longer than, say, blobbing over everything at once with a healing brush tool. In the end, though, having all of our changes isolated gives us more freedom to adjust the colors later. 
And it's much more important with a more complicated data set that we might change our mind on several times later. We don't want to go back and get stuck redoing those cosmetic adjustments. So we're working inside the adjustment layer and we want to make sure we do not change any of this original data. So whatever you do, make sure it's on a layer above. I want to start fixing this, covering up this charge bleed here. It's just the worst thing. So hover your mouse cursor, your pointer over the about the center, as close as you can get, and hold the alt button on your keyboard and shift and just drag it out so it goes over extend it past this chip gap because we're going to sort of clone this data and use it to connect these two lines across the chip gap. Press Control J to jump the layer up above this one. And we have a new layer. Now press Control T and hold the shift button down and rotate this data 90 degrees. Press Enter or click the check mark. Use your move tool, press V and just nudge these along until these diffraction spikes are lined up nice and even. That looks good. Now add, an, add a layer mask. Click this layer mask button. We can work on this. We've already got black and white here as our color, so press Control backspace to fill that adjustment layer. I'm sorry, the layer mask with all black and here's where I like to get my Wacom tablet out, because it's just much more comfortable to paint with the paint brush tool. And you just start with the white color, drawing on this layer mask, and it will cover up all this stuff that we don't want here with the cloned and rotated data. Let's see how far I go. Okay, we'll take care of this a little bit later. Paint over it, don't worry about it not quite matching up. So what I'd like to do next is create another curves layer to make this match up. I'm going to press the Alt key to make a, a clipping layer here, so it only affects the layer below it. And let's get rid of this lighter area here. So move the the Bezier point up on this curves adjustment layer a little bit until it sort of matches. Now we fill this adjust this why do I keep calling it an adjustment layer? Fill this layer mask with black a little again. And you might have a little bit it might take you a little bit more time with a mouse, but you can still do this. I use pressure sensitivity with my Wacom tablet and it goes by really quick. Just brushing over it until it looks like it matches. The other side doesn't need it that much. Now I'll make another one to lighten it up a little bit. Those parts closer to the, the center of the star. Fill it with black again. Now I'll start painting very quickly lighten it up until it matches. It blends in almost perfectly. You can't you can't even tell it's there. I see another place that needs to be darkened right here. Okay. I'm gonna do a little too far. It looks pretty good. You can make another layer here and quickly use the healing brush. This little it looks like a background galaxy got pulled over. I don't really need that. Give her that too. Let me give her that edge. Okay. Looks pretty good. Now, I don't really care to save all these things. I can just select them all, press Control E to merge them together. And this is really easy because it's not overlapping that diffraction spike. We can quickly run over this with the healing brush, and it does a really good job. Fix that. Looks pretty good. Almost didn't happen. Now I'm gonna fill in this really quick with just draw over it with some white. No, I need the brush tool for that. Switch it to a hard brush. 
Let's fill it in. These little corners don't look very good. People probably won't notice them. I see a little bit that I want to fix here. Not too bright. I'm just using the burn tool on it ever so slightly. Feather it out. If you want to kind of <laughs> smooth these little, looks like cat ears or something, just take the healing brush and blob over that. It looks a little bit better. You can continue working on this if you want, but I mean, it's it's a blown out star. You're not going to get it too much better unless you just totally fake it. Now I want to get rid of this filter ghost. It's probably one of the most annoying things to deal with, and there's no easy solution. All we can really do is minimize its effect. I sort of think of this as camouflage. It's not going to be perfect ever, but people, it's going to bring it down to such a level that it's not noticeable to the average person. Let's just say maybe another image processor could come along and see this. So I use this curves adjustment layer once again because I love curves and I'm always using them and I'm going to use my Wacom tablet again to paint on this layer mask and because we want to darken this I'm going to put this bezier point here and just darken it to where it's a little darker than the background noise. We want to have some room to work with here. And fill the, fill the layer mask with black again. Press control backspace. Get a soft round brush and draw over it. Paint it over. I don't know how you would do this with a mouse. I know some people do some pretty amazing painting work with mice. I don't know how. I think it's so much faster and it feels better with my tablet, so that's what I use. I don't really have any suggestions for you if you do use a mouse and don't know how to, don't have any way of painting on it, so I'll just get a Wacom tablet or any, whatever, it doesn't have to be a Wacom tablet, just any kind of pen tablet that lets you have pressure sensitivity. And the great, another great thing about this curves adjustment layer, because you see I went a little too dark there. I'm going to just press X, switch to the black, and undo that dark. Lighten it up a bit. And I'm going to speed this up so you don't have to sit through it. You know, it doesn't take that long though. Maybe five minutes. I actually had to redo this because my camera recording software, my screen recording software, it crashed and I lost the recording. So yeah. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I'm gonna toggle it on and off and see the difference. I maybe made it a little bit too dark. Let's just bring it down a little bit. I wanna check by making it all really contrasty, just see if we can bring it out. I don't, I don't really see anything here. Make it maybe slightly darker. Zoom in. It's, it takes the longest out of anything to fix these, but even that is not that long. Like I said, it's like, I don't know, five, maybe ten minutes for a really, really bad one. Okay. And just leave the curves there. You don't want to merge it with anything. You don't want to merge it with the original data, just to, so you can go back and look every now and then if you want. Make sure you're preserving the integrity of the original data as much as possible. I just saved the document and I don't think you need to see that, so I cut it out. Save often. The next thing we're going to do is fill this chip gap in. And I hate doing this because there are galaxies and stars and things in here that are forever lost to the gap. But you gotta do something about it, or if you're not gonna cut it off. And you, you can see here, 
there was a star here. There's diffraction spikes coming out of the gap. So there, there was a star there, but it's gone now. So the first thing I'm going to do to get rid of this chip gap, I want to say I'm not going to use the, the healing brush tool because it likes to invent. It'll pull over like a little galaxy from here just to get in there. It doesn't know better. And I don't like putting fake galaxies in there. It's bad enough that I'm putting like fake noise. So I'm going to take the magic wand tool, change it to a point sample, leave contiguous on, select our background layer, click on the black here, and yeah, that selects everything. And I don't want, I don't want this charge bleed selected either or everything around here. So I'm just going to press alt and shift in order to create an intersect selection and just go down here wrap around this selection and now we pretty much just have the chip gap selected and I'm going to create a new layer use my eyedropper tool to get a background color and press alt I'll well, change the change the point sample to 11 by 11 average. Now we got a more accurate representation of the background color. Press Alt and Backspace to fill that in with the foreground color. It's uh, you know what? We let me zoom in. I'm gonna press Control H to hide these marching ants. See these dots along the edge here? It's kind of rough. Those are those are actually cosmic rays, and I don't like those, so I want to actually fill over those too. Unhide that. Go into Quick Mask, show your selection. This just lets you quickly run a filter over it if you want, and I'm going to run a maximum filter. Set the radius at 3 pixels. You can see it's going to expand my selection by 3 pixels. Click OK. Exit Quick Mask by pressing Q again. And I'm gonna refill that with that foreground color again with alt backspace and deselect it. Now we're covering up those all those little spots to kind of takes care of two things at once. <coughs> that poor galaxy, I feel bad for it. To generate the noise, uh, you could go and use add noise filter. I find that it it looks okay but it, it's a little too sharp. I don't know it's there's not enough it, there's not enough options in this filter to really get it right so what I have discovered is you can use a camera raw filter and there are a few other parameters you can adjust to make it look almost exactly like the Hubble noise. So go into the FX tab here and change the amount to 12 and the size to thir 13 and the roughness to 60. This may take you a couple times to get right because you, as you can see you cannot see a preview here and there is no way that I could find out to make it so you can see a preview. Anyway, it's not too hard to just play with it and redo it if you need to. Press OK. Now you can see it. Aside from it being like a little darker or a little too bright in some places, it looks just like the background noise. It looks really good. Now using the same technique as I did with the other things, uh, like the, the filter ghost here, use the curves tool again just to adjust the brightness in places so that it matches up just perfectly. Make sure, once again, it only affects the layer below it using a clipping, clipping layer. The rest of it looks pretty good. I mean, star, we're gonna have to go over that. And quickly use the healing brush on that, in fact. Probably not. 
seeing these diffraction spikes. Okay, let's just merge these. I don't like having tons and tons of layers. I don't, we don't need them. You keep those all in one layer. Now I want to get rid of this streak, which I'll go ahead and put a curves adjustment up. Not that I really need it, but in order for you to see it easier in the video, I want to bring the contrast up. We want to be able to see the galaxy too. I don't want to blow it out, so. Okay, so you should be able to see this streak here. It's not too hard to get rid of. I'm going to use another curves adjustment. But this time I'm going to use a vector shape mask in order to have really simple, easy control over the shape of my curves mask. So I'll create a new curves and press this add vector mask button. Well, if you didn't have the, the layer mask there, it would say add layer mask, but after you press it once and you press it a second time, it creates a vector mask. Then you can use your pen tool. You want to set it to path instead of shape. So it goes into that vector mask and start. You don't have to make it perfect because it's a vector shape it you can go back and edit it really easy it's not like the pixel mask where you, it, it can be a pain to really get just right zoom in so i can see what we're doing if you never use the vector tools it can be a little bit annoying to get rid of like to get used to their quirks they are a little quirky You just have to use them and get used to it. And we do not we can just mask that off by selecting this. We don't want to change any of those. We can fill that with black on the pixel mask. So you can see that's not that's not gonna be affected. Just like nothing outside of this vector mask is going to be affected. Deselect. Zoom out. And now, uh, hide that vector mask so we can actually see what we're doing. Double click that and drop it down a little bit. Oops. Really almost got rid of it there. Got a few things I need to change though. The vector mask. We do not need to darken the middle of this galaxy that much, so you can go over it with the paintbrush tool. You don't really don't even need the, the Wacom tablet for this. Just blob it out so it's not putting that line across the galaxy. I still see there's this really faint edge there, so I'm going to Just the edge a little bit more with this tool. Pin tool. Okay, that looks good. Don't see it anymore. Okay, it's a little too dark there. One more change. All right, it's totally gone now. You can't can't see it at all. We can get rid of these glints now and we can use the same adjustment layer that we used to get rid of this glowing thing here by just adding some more painting to the, the layer mask. It's already there so you don't need to make another one. Just softly brush over these glints. Now we can get rid of this crosstalk pattern over here. We can pretty much do the same thing with the curves adjustment and painting technique. 
but you want to lighten it instead of darkening it. So a little lighter. Fill the, the layer mask with black and start painting the white where you need it. Okay, good. It's all gone. Um, there are a few little dots of black that I want to dab over with another white. Or you can just select them. I guess use the magic wand just quickly make the selection. Fill it in. I'm going to check the other point sources in this picture and get them done too. If you see this blob here, it looks dark and that's because Photoshop is weird about things when you're at 50% zoom level and it's a 16-bit color image. If you get to at least 67, 66.7%, it kind of goes away. I do I think I should adjust this though. It looks a little too dark, doesn't it? We don't really need to take care of this. I'd get rid of it if I needed to. I would get rid of it the same way as this filter ghost up here. But we're not going to show this in the end image because of this. This needs to be cropped off. We just can't show that, sadly. So I mean the crop line is going to be about here. So the most we need to take care of now is this glint here and a little bit of this this dragon's breath or whatever you want to call it here. So paint a little bit more. And again, you want to be at 67, 66.7% or it doesn't show you the correct color. Okay. And we're done. It looks like we're done, right? We can do the, uh, well, let's hide this. Get rid of this, delete it. We don't need it anymore. And save your smart object. Once it's done, look at your main document, and you can see there's only the blue channel left to do. If you want to compare what it, what it looked like before, you can quickly use your history panel and see what you did. It's a lot. Now I'm going to do the blue channel, and I'm just going to pretty much do the same thing I did with the red. So, and you don't really need to see that, so...
Well, I hope that was fast enough for you. And it's pretty close to done. I mean, you can start having fun with it, but there are a few little minor things that I want to adjust that I can't really do from the, the smart objects because I need the color information to help guide me. Like this is a little bit too blue here and there's some orange spots here. So I'm just going to do that really quick. So we can finally start finishing it up. I can, I'm going to bring my ellipse back that I used to guide me earlier and change this curves, which I was only using to make it easier to see in the video. I'm going to repurpose it for my final adjustments that I want to make to the brightness of the image. And I want the background sky to pretty closely match that ellipse up there. I don't want this, the middle of the galaxy to be uh, just a flat white thing, so make sure you don't make it too bright. I know people love to overdo things. I personally don't. It looks pretty good. The sky is reasonably dark. It matches with the ellipse. And we can see the background galaxies very well, as well as these faint spiral extended pieces of galaxy. This star is so big. <laughs> if you want, you can increase the saturation. A lot of people do. I tend not to. But if you do, you're gonna you might end up with this splotchy background and to get around that, something I like to do is First, well, I'm going to explain what I do before I show you. I create a solid color layer that has a mask that only affects like the darkest parts of the image. And it's set to color mode so that it colorizes it instead of like overlaying it with pixels. So to do that, I'll hold the control button here in the RGB channels window. Click it. And that will create a selection mask. And then go here to the, the adjustments and add a solid color. Make it black. Click the layer mask. Press Control i to invert it. And it's way, way too dark now. But we're going to switch it to color. And now I want to hold Alt. And it's pretty much taken away all the color from the image because it's, it's, it's affecting too much of the image. So I press Alt, click the layer mask so I can take a look at it, and adjust its levels so that it... Most of the objects need to be pretty black, and, and black means it's not going to affect them. It's okay if the background is not completely white. I'm not going to get rid of that color variation in the noise 100%, because it... Let's see how this looks. Zoom in a little bit. I'm not too pleased with how this bar turned out here. I'm gonna have to fix that. It looks pretty good. Some people really like to just go crazy with noise reduction. I'm not one of those people. Another fun way to finish this off is use the camera raw filter, and it it's really good at uh, bringing out the fainter parts without using these curves. It has this clarity adjustment thing you can use. So if you want to do that, hide the curves, uh, flatten the image, press Control A, press Control C, undo that, 
and paste over the top of it so you have this new clean layer to work with and you can convert it to a smart object if you want and run the filter <coughs> so now you can see this clarity slider you can go pretty far with it or not whatever you want whatever you like you do have to be careful with the edges here because it will it mistakes them for like an edge in your picture maybe you even should crop all this to uh, a rectangle before doing it <laughs> probably make it a lot easier play with your saturation if you want go crazy with it you can do everything all at once in here sharpen it reduce the noise a little bit if you want mess with the colors maybe I don't know it, the two channel thing tends to make things look cyan and orange because of the way the green channel is generated so you can sort of push it a little bit bluer and make, the, make that cyan more blue and the orange a little more red if you want it looks a little bit less artificial like that but do whatever you want just have fun you know this doesn't look very good on the video so I'll post finished version as a screenshot at the end this video took a bit longer than I thought it would and there are a few more details I might do if I wasn't making it but it is a pretty good representation of my process and if you made it this far thanks for watching and I hope you learned something bye bye